everyone, my name is Julie and we are so glad you're here. And you know what? We really hope this next hour or so is the best hour of your week. And as always, anytime, you can head on over to the Vineyard website, vineyardwheeling.com, and use the links there just to keep in touch with us. You can use the connect with us link to share a prayer request or make a comment. You can use the give link to support the ministry of the vineyard. You can check out the latest with our kids programming and get links to past sermons and really just so much more that you can find on the website anytime. Well, we're continuing our series called The Story of Jesus, picking up in the book of Mark chapter nine and our lead pastor, Chris, will be here with a message right after we enjoy some worship music. on this journey I get lost in my mistakes What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength And my story isn't over My story's just begun Fair you won't define me Cause that's what my father does Oh fair you won't define me Cause that's what my father does Shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Arrival's not the end game, the journey's where you are. Never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over if the story isn't good. Failure's never final when the Father's in the room. Failure's never final when the Father's in the room. Shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house, yeah. The Father's house, yeah, yeah. Prodigals come home, the helpless find home. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Prison doors fling wide, the dead come to life. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Miracles take place, the cynical find faith. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the are breaking, strongholds now are shaking, love is breaking through when the Father's in the room, love is breaking through when the Father's in the room, ooh, lay your burdens down, ooh, here in the Father's house, check your shame. It ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house 
Well, hello and welcome. Uh, I am so excited to be preaching again. I've had several weeks off here in the middle of the summer to focus on other things, and that's been great. And we have heard some wonderful messages from our teaching team. Uh, and I just want to say thank you to Jen and Myron and Chris, who always do a phenomenal job. Uh, and just to prove that, I'm going to re-preach Myron's message from last week and cover everything that he missed. No, I'm just kidding. Last week, Myron covered uh, Mark chapter 9, uh, uh, all the way through verse 30, and he kind of skimmed over the part that we're going to look at today. He, he kind of acknowledged it, read it, but, but uh, I want to dial in on one part of that that I think is super significant, and that is the first part, uh, verse 2 through 13. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Mark chapter 9, and we're going to start in verse 2 in just a moment. But I want to start with this question. Have you ever been excited that God is on your side? I mean, you just, you can just feel it. God is on your side. Things are going well. Life is clicking. Your plans are coming together. And you know God is in the middle. Have you ever been there? And I know we've all been on the other side of that where things aren't going our way, but, um, but it's, it's an amazing feeling, right? Now, several months ago, uh, I, my, uh, we drive a, uh, or we did, we drove a Honda Pilot, uh, and it's an older model, but it still had 100,000 miles left to go on it. It was a great, great car, fantastic, and I had just gotten some work done on it. It had the timing belt changed. It was really expensive. Five days later, the radiator implodes. It gets fluid into, uh, cooling fluid into the transmission, kills the transmission, and totals the car. I mean, I was like, God is not on my side today. I was so mad. I'm like, I was, wasn't planning on buying a new car for a while. And, and, uh, but then, like, you know, a couple weeks later, we found in the midst of a market where it's really hard to find a used car these days, we found the perfect used car. We're like, God's on our side. Woohoo. So we kind of got over the past, you know, the, 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 the death of the pilot. Uh, and then, I'm told, well, it's not really worth anything. Uh, you know, you can get a couple hundred bucks for it if you junk it. And uh, somebody suggested, put it on Facebook, see if somebody wants parts from the pilot and just sell it as a parts vehicle. So I listed it on, on Facebook Marketplace, and man, the call started coming in and coming in and coming in. Finally, uh, I think we listed it for $1,000, and uh, there was a guy from Baltimore who's like, I'll give you eight fifty dollars cash tonight. And I'm like, eight fifty. dollars Okay, 850. I was a little disappointed. Wanted the full thousand for it. You know, still lots of great parts on it. But anyway, I just wanted to be done. So he's like, I'll be there at 10 o'clock tonight. Well, this was last Saturday night. And I'm like, 10 o'clock? I go to bed early. You know, I got to work in the morning, all that. I'm like, okay, 10 o'clock, whatever. So he texts me on his way up from Baltimore. He's like, the car's overheating. I'm not going to make it. Uh, I'll be there at 1 a.m. Can you meet me at 1 a.m.? I was like, absolutely not. I'm not going to meet you at 1 a.m. I got to work in the morning, all that. So I'll meet you at 6.30. He's like, great. I'll be there. I'll be waiting at 6.30 a.m. So I get up at 5 in the morning, get my shower, take care of my chickens, um, and then uh, have some breakfast, go down to meet the guy, and he doesn't show up. He's a no-show. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And because, I mean, part of the deal is when I have to get up early, I don't know if you do this, but for me, when I have to get up early in the morning, I end up laying half awake all night because you never want to go fully asleep because you know you got to get up early. And so I didn't sleep well, and I was just, anyway. And I'm like, God is not on my side. What the heck is going on? But later that afternoon, I got a, had another guy who was local reach out and offered me the full amount and showed up and gave me cash and took the pilot and life is good and God is on my side again. I love it when God's on my side. Do you love it when God's on your side? I know, I know it's awesome, right? But the question in life really isn't, is God on your side? I mean, he's, he's shown us he's on our side. He sent his only son, Jesus, as a sacrifice to be crucified in my place, in your place. He loves you and he loves me so much. He is so on our side. There's just no question about that. God is on your side. The question is, are you on his side? You know, life is going to go up and down. We're going to see all kinds of things along the way. There are going to be good things and there are going to be hard things. That's life. God's on your side. Are you on his? And as it applies to the, this message today, you know, you have a plan for your life and, and I have a plan for my life. 
But God has a plan as well. And whose plan are you in on? Are you in this thing for your plan or are you in this thing for his plan? And that's what I want to look at today. So we're going to start in verse 2, Mark chapter 9, verse 2. This is what it says. It says, after six days. All right, we're going to stop there. After six days. Six days since what? Six days since Peter declared that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, you're absolutely right, Peter. It's been six days since Jesus shared with his disciples that he was going to go to Jerusalem. He was going to suffer at the hands of the religious leaders. He was going to be killed and he was going to rise from the dead. It's been six days since then. It's been six days since Peter pulled Jesus aside and said, Jesus, that is not the plan. That's not what we're going to do. I'm not going to let that happen to you. Forget about that. And it's been six days since Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Those are your plans, not God's plans. It's been six days since this interaction where Peter has a plan for Jesus's life, right? And Jesus says, that's not the plan, Peter. Peter's plan for Jesus's life was glory and victory, and it was for Israel. For the, it was to make Israel great again. That was what he was going to do. He was going to restore Israel to, to its glory back when King David was the king of Israel, and Jesus was going to make that happen. And oh, oh and by the way, in the process, Peter's life was going to be pretty amazing too because he was in the inner circle of Jesus who was going to lead this and restore that glory and sit on the throne and wear the crown and it was going to be amazing. That was Peter's plan. That was Peter's plan. The problem is, is that Peter's plan wasn't Jesus's plan. Which brings me to my first point. If you have your travel journal, pull that out. I want you to write this down. This is super, super important. Write this down, underline it, highlight it, whatever you do to, to, to make it jump out. But point number one, your plan for Jesus is probably wrong. Your plan for Jesus is probably wrong. So stay humble. So stay humble. And when your plan contradicts his plan, your plan has got to go. It's got to go. Like his plan is the one that matters. And I think it's super important. There have been times in my life, times in my ministry when I'm like, God's doing this and I know what the plan is and, 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 and I'm praying and I'm trying to get God to come along on my plan and he's got a different plan. And the, and the reality is for every one of us, there are going to be times when we are so wrong when we think we know what the plan is. Peter was wrong when he thought he knew what the plan was. But the key to getting through that is not being right all the time, because you're not going to be. It's being humble and walking humbly with your God. Now, Mark timestamps this. This is the only, I think there's two places in the, in the book of Mark where he timestamps something. He, these, are, these events are six days apart, where Peter Peter goes, no, 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 that's not the plan, Jesus. And Jesus is like, that is the plan. And Peter still doesn't get that it's the plan. Uh, and, and then we flow into six days later into what is about to happen. So let's pick up. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. So Jesus grabs Peter, James, and John. Now, Jesus had his cadre of, of followers or disciples, students who were learning from him, followers, whatever you want to call them. But he had an inner circle of, of 12. He, we call them the apostles, and they were kind of the leaders of all of that. But inside of that group, there, was, there were a, a group of three, Peter, James, and John, who, who seemed to be either Jesus's favorites. Could Jesus have favorites? I think Jesus could have favorites. Everybody has favorites. Why wouldn't Jesus have favorites? You could have favorites, or maybe there was something strategic about these guys. We know that Peter goes on to kind of be the, the chief leader of the whole movement later, um, and so maybe that's it. I don't know, but he grabs these three. The last time he grabbed these three and took them somewhere, big things happened. Remember back to Mark chapter 5 where G, uh, Jarius, the synagogue leader, is walking with Jesus and his daughter is sick and they come to Jarius and say, don't bother the teacher anymore, your daughter is dead. 
And Jesus is like, no, 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 we're going to go. And, and they go to the house and Jesus walks up to this dead girl's body and says, get up. And she does. And life comes back into her body. And, 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 and Peter, James, and John were there for that. And so everybody's thinking, well, maybe something big's going to happen because the last time he grabbed those three big things happened. And he takes them up a mountain to, to be alone, to pray, to, to connect with God and to connect with him. And, and uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, that you see consistently with Jesus, but you see consistently through the Old Testament is that, that big things happen on mountains. I think God loves mountains. If you're a beach vacation person, you're wrong. And if you're a mountain vacation person, you're right. I'm just saying, because God loves mountains. He does not, he has an I love mountains bumper sticker on his chariot. Um, he does not have an I love beaches. I'm just kidding. He probably loves Myrtle. Actually, I don't think he likes Myrtle Beach. I think he likes the secluded beaches. Anyway, big things happen on mountains. You know, we see Moses gets the law on top of a mountain. Elijah defeats the prophets of Baal on a mountain and God passes by on the side of the mountain. Jesus goes to the high places to, pr uh, to pray after feeding the 5,000 in, in, in this situation. And I know for me personally, uh, there's something about being in the mountains that just my soul connects with God. And I, I don't know if that's the way he made us or, I mean, there's nothing magical about a mountain, but God seems to like them. And so Jesus takes them up the mountain and it says, there he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. Now, Jesus goes up. He's got these three guys. They're having kind of this, this bro time. They're talking about what's going on. And, uh, and obviously, Jesus loves these guys, and, and they love him, and, and they're having this experience up on the mountain. And then Jesus kind of lights up. You know, he, uh, Mark understates this. He, he says he was transfigured before he transformed, not that he didn't look like Jesus anymore, but he became like white and bright. And he uses uh, bleach as, as an example. And Matthew and Luke, in their version of it, Matthew says that he became like the sun, like white was just shooting out of his skin, you know, and um, Luke says that it was like a bolt of lightning. He was so bright. So Mark is like, yeah, it's kind of like when you do laundry and you put bleach in and, you know, and you get that. Anyway, Mark is a little understated, but Mark is all about just the facts and let's keep moving, right? But clearly a miracle happened here. Um, and the miracle, I, you know, in one sense, the miracle was not that Jesus's glory was revealed to, to these three disciples in this moment. The miracle was that Jesus, the Son of God, contained that glory for 33 years up to this point because the presence and the power of God was resident in him all along. And yet he came and humbled himself and took the form of a human being. And this was just a glimpse of what the reality of his glory was, and he needed to show it to these three guys at this time. You know, why did he do that? Not 100% sure, but I do have a speculation, and that's this, and it's really the second point of the message. Sometimes God will give you a miracle to hold on to because things are about to get hard. So walk, walk humbly. <laughs> walk humbly is going to be, we're gonna, always going to come back to that in this message. Sometimes God will give you a miracle to hold on to because things are going to get hard. Things are about to get hard for the disciples. They are going to walk through one of the darkest moments, one of the most disillusioned uh, experiences of their lives when Jesus is eventually crucified. And I think Jesus is giving them this, especially these three, this experience that is undeniable. Like when he multiplied the, the loaves and the fishes, people were like, how'd that happen? You know, I mean, I know there was just a box lunch here and now everybody ate, but it wasn't like, you know, it, at least it wasn't described that way. But this, this, there's no, I mean, he's, he's like lightning. He's, I mean, there's light pouring out of this guy and, 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 and there was no denying it. And I think he gave, him, gave them that experience so that they could hold on to that. When things got dark, there was no question who Jesus was in their minds. You know, when about 12 years ago, uh, Christy and I bought a house 
in Woodsdale. Um, and and um, I shared several weeks ago that God gives us houses. This is one of the houses that God gave us. And every step along the way of, of, of getting that house, especially in the early days of it, from showing up to, on the day and time that, that it was being auctioned and not knowing that it was being auctioned, but looking for, for that house. I mean, it was crazy. All hair stands up on the back of your neck at moments like that. Or we found a newspaper article from 1976 with a history picture and a history of the house. And the family that built the house lived in the three neighborhoods that we lived in in the same order in moving before they moved into that house. And all the hair stands up on the back of our neck. And we're like, what happens next? Two, we found a sign in the attic that said no dumping by order of a Rondacoit town board. And there's only one in in the anywhere in the world, and that's the small little suburb of Rochester, New York that Christy grew up in. And we're like, whoa. I mean, just things that you're like, what are the odds of that? All these God moments, God signs. And I remember Christy saying, as we were reflecting on all of these, she said, she said, I think God's giving us these signs because it's going to get hard and he doesn't want us to give up in the midst of it. And I said, get behind me, Satan. No, I didn't say that, but, but I was like, it is not going to get hard. This is going to be great. These are signs. It's going to be good. But she was exactly right. It got hard. My health spiraled out of control. I got very sick. Things were really hard at work and everything on that house was 10 times harder than it should have been, and it just about killed me. But we had these signs to hold on to, like, no, God is in this somehow, and we're going to remain faithful, and we're going to keep going, and I'm not going to just lay down and die. <laughs> it, was, it was helpful. And I think sometimes God does that, and I think that's what God was up to here. He'll do that in your life as well along the way. It doesn't necessarily mean that, well, I know what God's plan is now. I've gotten this sign, this sign, and that sign. Maybe, or maybe he's just preparing you for what is about to come. Well, in verse four, it says, and there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. So Jesus is all lit up, so to speak, and he's standing there and they're having this, this moment with Jesus on the mountain. And then all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah show up. Now, this is a big deal for, for Peter, James, and John. Uh, they would have grown up going to you know, synagogue school. They know all the stories of their history and their faith. And in their history and in their faith, there are no two bigger figures than Moses and Elijah. Moses, who, who shows up in Egypt and goes to the most powerful man on earth and says, God says, let my people go. And the Pharaoh says, no. And Moses is like, all right, bring it on, God. And 10 different plagues come and hit the people of Egypt until they are willing to relent and let the Israelites go. And then Moses leads them across the Red Sea, splits the Red Sea, gives them the law. Moses brings them the law that makes them a civilized people. The, the, the law and, and, um, and the civilization that they built around it is, is just, just nothing short of, of amazing. And then Elijah, Eli, he's He's this powerful prophet. He's the prophet's prophet. He, he, you know, he just amazing things. He, at one point, uh, he goes to the king of Israel, who was a wicked king. He was, he actually uh, was a, a demonic idol worshiper. He was, and so he had kind of turned his back on God. And, and Elijah goes to him and says, look, here's what's going to happen. It's not going to rain anymore until I say so. And the king's like, yeah, whatever. And, um, uh, and it doesn't rain. And in an agricultural uh, economy where everything grows, animals start dying, crops die, nothing grows, and then people start dying. It's a big, hairy deal to the point that they have a showdown after several years. They have a showdown. They go up on the mountain, and it's Elijah versus 650 prophets of Baal. And it's like showdown. We're gonna have a dance off. And so they had this dance off on top of the mountain. And and Elijah's like, here's the ground rules. Here's what we're gonna do. We're both gonna make a sacrifice. We'll build an altar, kill an animal, stick it on there, but no matches. Wait, what do you mean no match? No matches. Like you gotta call down fire from heaven. 
And they're like, ah, no problem. There's 650 of us. So the prophets of Baal, he's like, and you guys get to go first. So the prophets of Baal, they, they build their altar. They put their, the bull on the altar. They, they, they start calling down on, from Baal and, call, and, and they're dancing around and they're chatting and they're cutting themselves and all kinds of things trying to, and nothing happens. It's just crickets. And Elijah's taunting them and just making fun of them. And then finally, he's like, all right, my turn. And so he builds his altar and puts the animal up there. And they pour buck. he has them pour buckets of water all over it. So there's puddles of water all around. The whole thing's saturated with water. And he's like, all right, God, lightning, whole thing's incinerated. Everybody's like, oh, my God. And he's like, that's right. It is God. He's God. And the people of God kind of have a moment, and they're like, what do we do? And he's like, well, first thing we do is we kill these 650 priests of Baal because they're leading you all to hell, and they do, and he's the national hero, and it's, it's huge. And, and just, they're just event after event. He is the, the prophet. He is the one. And so, the, like, if they had action figures, uh, Hasbro would have your Elijah and Moses. They would be the top like if they were Marvel in the MCU, in the Marvel universe, they would be the top superheroes of... So they show up, they're talking with Jesus. Now you got to remember, Peter has an agenda. He has a plan for Jesus's life, right? It's domination over the Romans, reestablishing the glory of the kingdom of Israel on earth in Jerusalem. And now Elijah and Moses are here. There's nothing that can stop us. And so Peter, in verse 5, he says to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And then it says, he did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Peter's a, Peter is a doer. You know, Peter's like, let's get things done here. These guys are here. The three of you are an unstoppable force. Nobody will question. The entire nation will rally around Moses and and Elijah, we need to build some shelters so they don't go anywhere. We're all going to hang out here, and then we'll make our way down the mountain. And, 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 and I, think, I think Jesus loves Peter's enthusiasm. Even though Peter is completely wrong about the plan, he's completely missing the point of what Jesus is up to. I think Jesus just loves his heart. It's like, oh, bless your heart, you know? They're like, y -y yeah, like we're going to do it, even though it's the wrong thing. I, I think Jesus likes Peter. I think he's probably shaking his head going, oh, Pete. Oh, Pete. But, but he loves him. And Pete still doesn't get it. And Pete sticks his foot in his mouth. He still hasn't surrendered to Jesus' plan or even begun to understand Jesus' plan. You know, Peter still wants to make Israel great again. Jesus has something much bigger in mind. He wants to rescue humanity. But he's thinking to himself, with all three of them, we can't lose. Now, it would be really easy to get, I don't know about mad at Peter, but get down on Peter at this point. I mean, gosh, Peter. Which brings me to point number three. Write this down. This is important because you need to have grace for Peter because God has grace for Peter and he has grace when you miss the point because you do a lot. God has grace when you miss the point. So walk humbly. Walk humbly humbly. Now, how do I know this? Because Peter goes on to deny Jesus three times after this debacle on the mountain, after not getting the whole picture. He'll get it, but he doesn't get it yet. And yet Jesus puts Peter in charge of the movement. He, he becomes the, the, the point leader for the whole movement later on. And he'll get it, and he'll get the point, and he'll understand what Jesus was up to, and he'll understand the plan after he walks through a great deal of pain and disillusionment, and, and God strips off the plan that Peter's holding on to and, and, and gives him the experiences that he needs to understand where God is going. But see, God doesn't write Peter off. He doesn't write him off. Jesus continues to walk with Peter, continues to pour into Peter, continues to love Peter. And Peter will eventually get it. And Peter, Peter will eventually go on to be part of changing the, the whole world, playing a big part in the, in the story of history. But right now, Peter doesn't get it. And thank God that he has grace for us when we don't get it, when we, when we miss it. Understanding that is super important because then we can have grace for other people when they're not getting it. 
we can continue to walk with them when they're not getting it. And we can be assured that God's not writing us off. He's probably smiling, shaking his head sometimes, <laughs> but he loves us even when our plan isn't really his plan. Well, in verse seven, it says, then, then, powerful word. Uh, again, looking over at Matthew and Luke, uh, it says, while Peter was still talking. So Jesus is, is all lit up. Moses and Elijah show up. They're having this conversation. Peter goes over and starts to say what Peter says. And it says, while he was still talking, God didn't even give Peter a chance to get out an entire thought and Boom, he zaps everything away. It was while he was still speaking. It says, then a cloud appeared and covered them and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love, listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. Now again, as good Jewish boys having grown up in synagogue school, they would understand the Old Testament implications of the cloud. God's presence shows up in a consistent way throughout the Old Testament in the form of a cloud, whether it's Moses on the mountain or in the, tabernac in the tabernacle or the cloud, pillar of cloud by day that led the, the Israelites through the desert. God shows up in a cloud. And in this situation, God shows up in a cloud and he just shuts the thing down. He's like Moses and Eli, boom, gone. What are you doing, Peter? It's not about these two guys. You don't need these two guys to accomplish what I am here to accomplish. This is not about your plan. And God shuts it down like that. And then he says, listen to my son. Listen to my son who told you six days ago, I'm going to Jerusalem. I am going to be handed over to the religious leaders. I am going to suffer at their hands and be executed. And I am going to rise from the dead on the third day. They still don't get that. They are not listening to Jesus at this point. They're still listening to their plan, not his. Guys, we do the same thing all the time. Thank God he has grace for us in that. But the thing that we can learn in the midst of this is we need to seek his plan, not ours. And we need to listen to Jesus. Well, in verse 9, as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So he tells them, keep this on the, the down low and, until I've risen from the dead. And then they kept the matter to themselves, discussing what this rising from the dead thing meant. They still didn't get it. They still they, they were so locked in to how they thought it should be that they couldn't mentally, emotionally get their, even begin to get their arms around the fact that Jesus meant what he said. They still didn't get it. He told them very clearly, I'm going to die and be raised to life. Now, what do you think that means? I don't know. What do you think that, I, like, that, that's what it means. Listen to my son, God says. Guys, there's going to be times when you think you know what God is up to, and you're probably wrong. So walk humbly with your God. Walk humbly. Hold loosely. Hold tightly to the things that you know are true. Hold loosely to the things that you, the plans you have for God and you have for you. Know that he has grace for you in the midst of it. And listen for Jesus's voice, because ultimately he will bring it clear, just like he did for these guys. And the fourth thing is this. Stop trying to leverage Jesus for your plans. His plan is better. Stop trying to leverage Jesus for your plans. We all do this, don't we? We all try, like, God, will you get on board with my plans? Will you bless my plans? This is what I want to do. Would you, may, would, you know, would, you, would you be on my side? Would you work things out to my benefit? We all do that. And I think it's, in part, it's just being a human being. In part, it's our culture. The, the, the truth of the matter is, is that we are all part of a much bigger story, one, that, one that, that, that covers the story arc of, of history and the story arc of eternity. We're a small speck, really, in the overall story that is unfolding around us. 
But we don't think that way. The modern mindset, the modern mindset is that the world revolves around me. That I am the center of history. I am the center of the story. I am what it's all about. And we all think that way because we're all part of this modern culture that we live in. And in reality, we have a very small part to play. It's very tiny. Significant. I believe every one of us has a significant part to play, but it's a small part to play. And that is a very offensive statement in 2021 in the United States of America. You are not the center of the world. It is not about you. Now, the good news of this is if you can get this through your head and through your heart, you'll be a much healthier, happier person. Because when you're the center of your own universe, you are a neurotic mess. You just are. It's, it, it's awful. You need to understand the purpose of life isn't you. It's not your plan. It's his. It isn't your happiness. It's his will. It isn't your pleasure. It's his desire for you. It's him. Until you get that part, you will be missing his plan and you will be chasing your own, and you're going to be missing out on what God is doing. Now, don't get sideways about that. Walk humbly and accept his grace and invite him to lead you into his plan for your life, into the story he has for you to live out and the part that he has for you to play. And if you will jump in on his plan instead of trying to leverage him for yours, if you will accept that it's not about you, this ride through life makes a lot more sense. It's a lot more free. It's liberating. So whose plan are you living for? Yours or his? It makes a difference. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that you have a plan for every one of our lives and that it's better than our plan for our lives. God, give us patience for the process. Lord, would you speak to us? You know, the father said, this is my son, listen to him. Lord, help us to hear your voice and help us to live your purpose in this world and in the next. And Lord, I pray that you would fill our lives with the blessing that comes from living for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, isn't it great to know that even when we may be off in our understanding of what God is doing, that God is patient, that he continues to invite us to walk with him and join him in what he's doing. You know, Peter thought he had a big vision for Israel to have the chance to get right with God, but God's vision was even bigger for all of humanity to have the chance to get right with God and for Peter to be included in that plan. So what about you? If God has given you a vision or a passion, have you taken it to God and asked Him for His perspective? What if He wants to do something different or maybe something more with that passion, with that vision? Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 is a great reminder. And there's a paraphrased version of the Bible called The Message that puts it like this. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. So I wanna encourage you, take some time this week to do this. Share your heart with God and then listen to what he says back and then go with his plan because you know he will never mislead you. He will always keep you on track.